Now, the Galileo Project, um, an update. What's going on and uh, what preparations are being made to start collecting data? Yeah, so uh, the UAP branch, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Branch, is working hard on uh, the first uh, systems that, that are going to uh, collect data on the skies. And, uh, you know, both on the hardware branch and in terms of the, the software the machine learning algorithms that are going to identify known objects and sort of filter them out and and reduce the the data stream so so that is well underway and then in terms of the interstellar objects branch of the project we uh, were able to secure um, you know about a quarter million dollars of Southwest Research Institute internal funding uh, for Alan Stern and uh, a team of scientists there uh, to, you know, study the initial uh, parameters related to an interstellar object mission proposal. Um, something that you know we've done in tandem within the Galileo project, uh, but more from a you know physics point of view. They're looking at it from a engineering uh, point of view. And uh, this is, you know, the the work from this study is going to go into an eventual proposal to uh, NASA or perhaps a privately funded mission uh, for a future rendezvous with an interstellar object. So, uh, Galileo project is, you know, everyone is 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 working hard, and um, you know, exciting things are in the works. Now, what is the uh, the UAP detection um, experiments? What are those going to look like? I mean, what is it just going to be optical, or is there going to be other things involved? Yeah, I believe it's uh, I believe it's a combination of um, of of many different types of of sensors, both across the electro electromagnetic uh, spectrum, but also you know infrasound, and you know the idea is that. You want to be able to look um, for for signals in in many different realms because then you know it reduces your chance of having you know false signals and also allows you to say uh, differentiate from you know a mirage uh, or you know a laser being pointed at a cloud uh, from you know actual objects. So so that multispectral information and information that you know also is in the in the sound domain is important because it you know gives you gives you that that context. So so I believe the the engineers are, are working hard on on integrating um, all these types of sensors. Now, do you think that? Um in, in the filtering process, you know, obviously you need to be able to recognize, you know, a, a United Airlines flight coming in from Dallas or whatever and just filter that out because you're going to see plenty of that stuff. But is this or the sort of computer programs that are being written, are they going to be able to detect weird atmospheric phenomena like ball lightning, natural things like that? And could atmospheric scientists use the data set to study that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, for sure. So, I mean... It's, you know, we can train the data set on, you know, whatever, or we can train the algorithm on, on whatever data sets we have. And so that includes birds, planes, helicopters, drones. Um, but, you know, there, there certainly are other phenomena that, that um, you know, may happen in the atmosphere and may ex certainly explain, um, you know, maybe so, some portion of, of UAP sightings. Um, that you know we don't have robust data on, and you know whether that's ball lightning or something else, um, anything that's sort of unclassifiable that we don't have, you know, significant amounts of of training data to provide to the algorithm, is um, going to fall out as a you know as a object that should be. Or, or a phenomenon that should be uh, studied. So, so the point of this this algorithm is is to filter out the boring stuff and and leave the more interesting stuff and sort of to reduce reduce the workload. And you know, I mean, atmospheric phenomena are 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 I hope um, 
one of the major contributions um, of, of of the Galileo project. You know, having having cameras on the sky, multispectral information about the atmosphere in this way hasn't been done before uh, for the purposes of science. And and so, you know, I am very optimistic about um, contributions that can that can be made to um, atmosphere, you know, the, the study of the atmosphere and, uh, you know, more more rare phenomenon. I think it would be absolutely amazing and poetic if you caught an interstellar meteorite entering on a camera that was looking for a UAP <laughs> and you were <laughs> yeah. able to recover it. <laughs> That's right. So that's some of the that's some of the crossover uh, that actually is is the point of crossover between the two branches. Now, you know, obviously, when you're looking for UAP, you do want a large field of view, um, but you also need a lot of you know multi-spectral um, information and and all of that. But but with interstellar meteors, you know, as long as you know, you could just you could just set up honestly like really cheap cameras um, as long as you have a lot of them <laughs> and you're able to triangulate uh, the meteor's trajectory because meteors are bright and um, you know as long as you're able to get the velocity components you know by having more than one station you're good um, of course if you want to do spectroscopy that adds complications but the other the other um, consideration here is that meteor Meteors typically burn up very high in the atmosphere, so each station can see, you know, a lot of sky. And so I hope that, you know, whether it's through the Galileo project or, or some future initiative, we can um, build a network of cameras that is really tailored to finding interstellar meteors. So these are going to be uh, really cheap, low-tech stations um, with you know, designed such that you have, you know, parallax measurements. So you, you have, you know, one or two stations per, but, but these don't have to be overcomplicated. The, the, the key here is having enough ground coverage that we can expect a, a detection of an interstellar uh, meteor. And right, right now, um, most meteor networks are, are fairly small in terms of atmospheric area. Uh, we just need to we just need to supersize it. Now, what can you learn, uh, you know, interstellar or or solar system? Either way, what can you learn by studying um, the meteors as they fall, as they're actually falling through the atmosphere? Can you point a spectrometer at that thing and characterize its composition that way without ever actually having to find it? Yeah. So that. That's that's the big advantage. And so in 2019, Avi and I proposed, um, you know, when we proposed this this network of, of uh, cameras that search for interstellar meteors, we noted that even if you're unable to recover the object, if you point a spectrometer as, you know, at the trail of light as it's burning up, you know, this will encode information about the composition of the object. and um, And you can look for you know all, all types of sort of uh, spectra in there and and you know that's it's a really exciting way um especially if these if these interstellar meteors are smaller because smaller ones are more abundant and and perhaps um they won't make it to the ground like cneos 2014 or 108 um it's a really exciting way to study their composition without having to rely on uh follow-up uh, work, you know, looking for pieces on the ground. And with, with dust, you know, essentially interstellar dust, the population of that has to be absolutely enormous. So this is something that you might see very regularly is, uh, you know, instead of an interstellar meteorite, just an interstellar meteor. And that mm -hmm. could be something so populous that it's, it just happens all the time. And that people people right now when they see a meteor fall and you know in the, in the night they can look at it and say i wonder where that came from you know yes 